And so really, I positioned myself in Gore Royalty Corp, anticipating that the established producers and the emerging producers will have to start to allocate significant capital to mine development and exploration. And we're there to effectively act as a bank for that type of activity. Welcome to the My Future Business Show, where we get you in front of your best audience and keep you there. Not only are we interviewing the biggest names in business to help you become even more successful, we're inviting you to book your spot on the show to help you grow your business. So at the end of the call, make sure you fill in the interview application form at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. Hi, and welcome back to the My Future Business Show. My name's Rick Nusky. I am your host, and this is the show that gets you in front of your best audience and keeps you there now on today's call. I'm with the wonderful David Garofalo. Garofalo? Garofalo. Garofalo. I knew I would get that wrong. My apologies, That's David. That's all right. <laughs> I've been practicing it for so long now. David is the CEO, President, Chairman, and Director of Gold Royalty. And we're going to be talking about not only Gold Royalty, the organization, but we're going to be talking about gold. But before all of that, David, I'd love to uh, spend a few moments learning a little bit about you. Now, um, traditionally, I guess you'd say we'd, we'd learn uh, where you're located. Where is home for you? I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, but I've been in Canada my entire career, spent the first 50 years of my life in Toronto before I moved out here to run Gold Corp about five years ago. Fantastic. Now, do you have any uh, uh, time away from work? And if you do, what's the uh, what's your leisure time look like? What's, what's that involve? Well, it's hard not to enjoy the outdoors in British Columbia. The skiing is fantastic in the wintertime, cycling in the summer and, and hiking um, is incredible. I, I live in the rainforest on the north shore of Vancouver. And uh, with on the mountainside, so it's hard not to enjoy nature here and, and take advantage of everything British Columbia has to offer. Yeah, I wonder is it important for you, uh, being so busy, um, to take time away from the from the workplace? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, trying to stay physically fit uh, to keep the mind clear, I think, is extremely important. It's always been an important element of of my work regimen um, over the course of my career. Yeah, fantastic. Now, uh, I love movies. I don't know if you love movies. Uh, do you like any movies? Are you a movie goer? Uh, I do. Um, I, I have to say I'm a big Humphrey Bogart fan. I've seen every movie he ever made. Um, so I look like old black and whites. And in terms of the more modern cinema, um, you know, Francis Ford Coppola, uh, The Godfather, uh, the f- number one and two and, and uh, Apocalypse Now, those are some of the best movies ever made. Excellent. I would have to agree with you. Now, in terms of growing up, I also love to learn a little bit about our time when we were children in our formative years, I guess you'd call them, David. What do you remember about growing up that uh, is fun for you? Well, I would say it's uh, growing up with a large extended family. Both of my parents um, had four siblings and as a result, I had 31st cousins growing up oh, wow. all lived in the same neighborhood and um <laughs> and we all you know that my cousins were my friends uh, my best friends and still are to this day i'm in touch with virtually all of them and we grew up playing a uh, typical canadian we're first generation canadian we come from an italian family immigrants but we played road hockey and um and all sorts of sports together but i remember playing on our street and we all lived in the same neighborhood uh, growing up. And, and it, interestingly, even though our parents were immigrant laborers, uh, all of us went to university and many of us ended up becoming corporate leaders. Um, one of my cousins was the head of Deloitte Canada. Another one is the head of a major law firm here in Canada as well. Another one was chief actuary for, for a major accounting and actuarial firm as well. Another one was head of ophthalmology for a major hospital in Toronto. Wow. Um, and they all came out of that immigrant class, which is kind of a typical Canadian immigrant story. Yeah, it is a success story, isn't it? You know, I came with nothing and here I am. And uh, in those early years, David, you've obviously been hanging around the right uh, right fruit. Um, who, who, who stuck out for you in your, in your early years? Who was, a, I guess, a bit of a mentor in your family or even your circle of friends that really helped you become the man you are today? Do you think? Um, well, look, I, I would say in the mining space, um, you know, and I've been in the mining space for over 30 years and, and joined um, a mining company right out of um, at Deloitte's when I just completed my CPA um, here in, in Canada. And um, I was introduced to a gentleman named Richard Ross, my first boss. And, and Richard was a young controller at the time. And I was a, a young accountant doing consolidations 
Uh, he rose eventually to be CFO and then CEO of Inmet Mining, my first employer in the mining space. Mm-hmm. And he taught me everything I knew about the mining industry um, and went on to run the company for 10 years through the early part of this century from 2000, 2010, after I had left. But, um, you know, we grew up in the industry together and he taught me a lot and, and he still remains and will always remain my mentor in the space. So I've had many other yeah. mentors in the industry for sure. Yeah, thank you for sharing this, David. Um, we have a lot of uh, startup entrepreneurs and small to medium-sized business owners listening to this. We have investors, a whole whole range of different uh, listeners uh, listening in, and it's always important for them to get a bit of an insight into you as a human being. I'd like to know, being so busy, how do you look after yourself? What does a daily routine look like, and is it important to, to look after yourself? It, it, it is absolutely, and and um, I have to say, this pandemic and how I've set up myself from a work perspective has allowed me a lot more flexibility around you know physical fitness. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, quite often, I'll, I'll uh, take two hours in the day at some point, whether it's the middle of the day, beginning of the day, end of the day, just depending on my work schedule, to either cycle or trail run with my dogs um, and get you know, a, a good amount of physical fitness in over the course of the day and it energizes me because I do have business interests across the globe. I deal with Asian partners as well. And mm-hmm. quite often I'm on the phone quite late into the evening. And so you need to sustain your energy. So having uh, some physical fitness every single day of the week is an important part of, uh, of how I operate. Now, David, you mentioned dogs. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a dog lover myself. What sort of dogs do you have? I have a Labradoodle who's 11 years old and a Portuguese <laughs> water dog that's five. Oh. And uh, <laughs> sisters from another mister, but they do get along really, really well. And they, they do everything together. They sleep together and they run with me together. And, and uh, it's, it's fun to have them around. Yeah, you tell them your deepest, darkest secrets too. They're always there for friends and always smiling and uh, looking forward to seeing you. Thank you for sharing now. In terms yeah. of your role, um, what do you love the most? What what fires you up? Well, to me, it's developing people and putting the right bums in the right seats, honestly. And that's always energized me since I've taken on C-suite positions really over the, the latter 15 years of my career, um, or actually almost 20 years now in, in various C-suite roles, is recruiting the right people for the right jobs and then helping them develop into, uh, you know, to, to, to achieve their best potential. Um, and, and there are more than a few C-suite executives in this mining industry that have worked with me at some point. I'm s- super proud to see them flourish. I feel like I had a small part in developing them and putting mm-hmm. them into the right roles so they have the right skill set yep. to achieve their maximum potential. Yeah, that's a wonderful uh, response. Thank you. Now, I know that you sit on a board of directors for many different things, and I've been doing my research, and I noticed that uh, you are having involvement with the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that. That's very interesting. Well, I'm the deputy chair, and it's interesting. When I moved out to Vancouver five years ago to take the Gold Corp job, uh, most of my uh, volunteer board positions had been in the healthcare sector, and I felt like I'd had my fill of it doing that for many years. And I said, I want to do something on the nonprofit side in Vancouver to integrate myself into the community here, but I want to do something I know nothing about. And uh, the obvious one was the symphony because I can't keep a beat to save my life. (laughs) Me too. And I have no musical skills whatsoever. But I thought, wow, would it be interesting to understand the business of music? And I have to tell you, I've learned a ton doing that. I've expanded my horizons. I've learned a lot about the creative sector. um, But I've also learned about the business of the creative sector and how it operates. I mean, business is business at the end of the day. Yep. But having a creative element to it just adds that dimension that I hadn't had before. Yeah, that's wonderful. And now you sit on a number of different boards. What are those? Are you still involved with them? Um, yeah, I, I'm on the Vancouver Board of Trade Board as well. Mm-hmm. And, and and that was part of trying to integrate myself into the business community here in Vancouver as I try to establish myself. And that covers off my nonprofit commitments. And, and uh, in terms of public company, I'm the chair, non-executive chair of Great Panther Mining Limited, which is a diversified gold and silver producer with operations in Brazil and Mexico um, with a very capable management team that I helped to recruit and and a very strong board that I helped assemble. I'm really excited about their prospects. Um, And then, of course, I'm running Gold Royalty Inc. um, and uh, and serve on a couple of other public company boards, but those are my principal occupations. I also run a a precious metal investment fund with some Mm -hmm. Chinese partners. Mm -hmm. Marshall Precious Metals, and we're investing, it's a closed-in fund that we're investing in early stage exploration on the gold side. Um, It's something I've always been a big believer, and even when I was running large 
uh, mining companies. I always had an incubator fund set aside to outsource our exploration. I recognized that established producers really didn't have the skill set or the risk tolerance to conduct grassroots exploration. So supporting the juniors yep. uh, seemed like a good idea because that helped populate our pipelines in the long run. Now, you've had a lot of experience, and I know a lot of people give me feedback about how much they take away from the show when people say, hey, look, I learned this from failure. What can you tell us about failure? How important is it in your growth? Yeah, look, um, failure is important. Um, and, and failure in our business comes through uh, the low probability of success on exploration. Mm-hmm. You know, recognize probably 19 out of 20 times you don't succeed. Um, that's just that's just the uh, probably the highest risk component component of the value creation equation or chain in the mining business. Mm-hmm. Recognizing that you, that low probability is, is just part of it and having a diversified approach towards exploration is extremely important to that. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you, you, you put um, a lot of projects through the study phase and sometimes they don't turn out to be feasible, at least in the first instance. Yep. And it's being persistent and resilient and coming back to those projects and revisiting them and putting more capital into them um, in the study phase and the exploration phase to make them economic. Mines are not found, they're created, they're made, yep. and they're made through a lot of sweat equity oh, yeah. and, and also some meaningful investment in the exploration and feasibility work. I was uh, deeply involved with BHP Billiton for many years in the uh, Olympic Dam projects, looking for uh, mineral deposits of all sorts uh, in exploration drilling, uh, stoke mining, all that sort of jazz. Now, are you finding it, is it more and more difficult to find uh, these gold deposits as time goes by, do you think? It, it, it is, um, and and I would say a lot of the near-surface high-grade deposits have been found, so we're looking at you know, near-surface low-grade deposits that require bulk tonnage mining, mm-hmm. more significant capital, or we're going deeper in more remote regions of the world, maybe uh, assuming more political risk in, yep. in parts of the world that hasn't seen a significant amount of development. So it's become a, it's become a trickier business, and what that's translated into is longer lead times to production. So, you know, from discovery to first production typically can be 20 years or more um, and and can go through various hands before a project is developed. It, you know, quite often there are three or four or five owners of that project before it becomes a productive mine. Yeah, absolutely. Now, does the value proposition in, in gold um, increase as it changes hands? Like we're, we're saying that it's harder to find, therefore it's harder to mine. Um, is that where the value proposition is or is that dependent on the stock exchanges? How does it work? Where's the value in gold? Why is it so valuable? Well, I mean, gold is extremely scarce. It's, it, it's called a precious metal for, for that very reason. For a reason. It's very difficult yep. to find. There's very minute quantities of it in, in the Earth's crust, and there's very little of it that's actually produced. You know, if you look at all the gold that's ever, ever been produced, it's about 200,000 metric tons. Volumetrically, just to give you a sense of what that looks like, it's about four Olympic sized swimming pools. It's not it's a not lot. Much, not much. And and we only mine as an industry about four thousand metric tons a year, which is, you know, a very minute quantity. So you can imagine how difficult it is to find, how difficult it is to extract, the capital intensity required to do so, the operating cost risk, political risk that you're assuming. It's it's a tricky business. And uh it's not for the faint of heart, that's for sure. Are there any peripheral minerals that uh, you get involved with just inadvertently as you're mining? Do you, like, silvers and things like that? Yeah, it's, it's certainly. I mean, in, in you know, gold deposits are quite often found in polymetallic settings. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're looking at complex metallurgy with multiple countable metals uh, uh, produced. Uh, quite often you're producing both a dory and a concentrate. It's not uncommon to have multiple metals in the deposit that's primarily gold. Now, you uh, led um, the largest merger and acquisition in gold mining history. It was $32 billion. I'd love to uh, hear that story. Would you mind sharing it with us? Yeah, look, you know, this was uh, a little over two years ago now mm-hmm. uh, when Bullcorp merged with Newmont uh, to create the biggest gold producer in the world, both in terms of production, about 6 million ounces a year, and also in terms of market capitalization. Now, with gold having run, um, that company on a combined basis is three times the size uh, that it was when we merged. Wow. Um, and so uh, that was really about creating scale and creating sustainable production levels. And, and so if you remember, if you harken back to even 2018, Barrick announced an at-the-market merger with Rangold. And both of those companies were dealing with precipitous drops in their production 
on a standalone basis. Mm -hmm. By combining the created critical mass and allowed them to focus on a nucleus of production that can sustain a longer term. Newmont saw that as an existential threat yeah. and was concerned that Barrick would surpass them both in market cap and in production and, and then make Newmont vulnerable. And so Gold Corp um, is kind of a, a, a second tier senior producer uh, really, you know, heard the music playing and, and decided we needed to find a chair. And, yeah. and so we, we merged with Newmont to create the biggest producer. And now I think really the, the merging at the top of the food chain is large, by and large done. Both of those companies now are now at a sustainable production level when they combine their portfolios. Uh, they, they wean themselves of the non core assets and focus on the ones that could sustain higher production levels for longer. Yeah. And, and so now... The, the scope for consolidation uh, can be found, I think, in the next level down in mid-tiers. There's a lot of mid-tier companies, a lot of emerging single-asset producers that really don't have the critical mass that they need uh, to attract market attention from general investors. Mm -hmm. So I think when the COVID crisis has passed us and there's more opportunity to do physical due diligence, I think there's pent-up uh, consolidation that's likely to happen in that mid-tier space. Yeah, fantastic. Now, I know there'll be a lot of investors, small-time, medium-sized investors and the likes, and you being an investor yourself, how important it is, is it to uh, uh, diversify your investment portfolio, do you think? Well, you know, it's a very uncomfortable position to be when you're a single-mind company. Mm. Um, when things go wrong, there's nowhere to hide. Uh, so having that diversification is important so that you can spread the risk across multiple operating assets. But also, uh, scale is important. Um, you know, what we failed to do in the gold sector, in spite of the fact that we've had a nice run over the last couple of years, is really attract that incremental general investor, ones that can buy Apple, they can buy financial institutions, they, they look across the broad spectrum of, of equity investment opportunities, and gold has to compete with that. And the gold industry, on an aggregate basis, is still smaller than Apple in yep. terms of market cap. So yep. we don't have nearly the liquidity uh, that some of the other sectors do. So creating that scale is extremely important to attract the general investors to show up on um, the right indices to get that passive capital as well allocated. So it's really important to create scale, to have that liquidity and get into the right indices and attract that general investor. So that's why I think the industry, given how small it is, mm -hmm. uh, really needs to look at merging to create that, that critical mass of scale and diversification within the operating portfolios that they manage. This is a wonderful call uh, thus far. Thank you very much for all the, all the knowledge and inf information you're sharing. Now, I'd love to know uh, if we can pivot. Why did you join Gold Royalty Corp? What was the momentum behind that? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I've been studying the gold sector, obviously, for, for my entire 30-year-plus career. And what we find ourselves at is an existential crisis in the gold sector with reserves uh, experiencing a precipitous drop of nearly 40% in the last seven years. And that's just come through, uh, through depletion. Mm -hmm. uh, the industry exited the last bull cycle 10 years ago with a lot of debt, a lot of cost escalation, and as a result, investors demanded they focus on harvesting returns from their existing asset bases, deleveraging, and generating free cash flow and returning dividends to shareholders, buying back stock. So the industry has done a great job in that regard. It's yeah. leverage. In fact, for the first time in my career, the entire industry is at net zero debt. So they've oh, done wow. a great job of, of really managing their balance sheets and they pay good dividends. Um, but what they haven't done is reinvest back in exploration or replace those depleting reserves. And so, really, what that tells me is the industry is going to have to refine its skill set, mine development, and exploration, and start to allocate meaningful capital to replace their depleting reserve base, because that will translate into significant drops in production over the next few years. So, what I've tried to do is position myself at that part, of, at that end of the spectrum, in terms of what would support development and exploration, what royalty companies do. Because mm -hmm. royalties can access capital much more cheaply than the established producers can do. And what they do is they put that capital to work to help stimulate both exploration and development and take royalties back. And so really, I position myself in Grow Royalty Corp, uh, anticipating that the established producers and the emerging producers will have to start to allocate significant capital to mine development and exploration. And we're there to effectively act as a bank yep. for that type of activity. 
Yeah, I'd love to learn, just so people understand this if they're interested in this, is to understand your business model a little bit further because it's sure. still probably a little bit vague to somebody seeing this for the first time. I'd love to learn a bit about um, what actually a royalty and streaming company means. Sure. I mean, what a royalty company does is put capital into the ground uh, by providing uh, cash investments to uh, producers, emerging producers that can't otherwise access capital cheaply enough uh, to realize their growth ambitions. What we take back in return when we make that investment is a royalty on the, the underlying property, the mine. Right. And, and so we get a percentage, a fixed percentage of the revenue from that mine once it's operational. Typically, 1% to 2% uh, net smelter return. In other words, 1% to 2% of the net revenue from the mine as a payback for that capital investment. And what that does is provide our shareholders with double-digit rates of return on that invested capital. Um, so we have to do, obviously, a lot of due diligence on yeah. the underlying asset yeah. and the operator to make sure that we can realize that type of return. But what our investors get is leverage to the gold price. So if the gold price is go goes up, then our revenue goes up. Mm -hmm. Also, we get leverage to the exploration success that our underlying operators and operating partners realize as they drill out their deposits and grow them geologically. So think of it as uh, owning a, a owning a um, gold ETF with exploration upside. So yeah. you can certainly understand the appeal of owning a gold ETF. You get the exposure to the gold price without having to store the gold. It's, it's done mm -hmm. for you. Yeah. But what you don't get is exploration upside. Um, you don't get exposure to exploration success. So the royalty really provides the best of all worlds. It provides that leverage of the gold price, leverage the expiration. What it also does is insulate our shareholders from the underlying operating costs and capital cost risk of actually operating a mine because we have no exposure to that. Our, our exposure is entirely to the top line, to the revenue. Yeah, fantastic. I, I always think about sustainable mining. I'm wondering about net zero emissions and net zero water consumption. What's your take and involvement in that side of things? Well, you know, we, we don't operate the mine, so we don't have direct no. um, ability to actually uh, ensure that ESG practices are at, at, uh, at, at best practices. But what we can do is before we actually make the investment is uh, utilize stringent criteria to uh, filter out the operators that don't uh, pursue best practices on ESG. Yeah. Um, so we just won't, frankly, take a royalty back on an asset that isn't run by a capable and responsible operator. Makes sense to me. Now, in terms of where you're operating, where are you? Uh, are you global at the moment or is it? Um, We're America's focus. We're as far north as Alaska and as far south as uh, as Brazil. Mm -hmm. And we have um, royalties on 18 projects across the Americas. Yep. In various stages of development. Um, and as I said, they vary from one to 2% um, of, of the revenue uh, and right now we're focused on the Americas but our mandate is global uh, we're willing to look uh, across the world at uh, deposits that have good geological models with significant exploration upside because really that's what supercharges returns for our shareholders while we have uh, a minimum return criteria of 10% on known reserves we don't pay for any of the exploration upside. That's the gravy. That's really what supercharges returns over time. Yep. So we have to be comfortable that these deposits have significant exploration upside, but for the drilling. You know? So once uh, these operators start to focus on exploring uh, and, and growing out their deposits, and it's in their interest to do so because they build up significant physical infrastructure, they want to leverage that infrastructure for the long term, they're going to spend that money on exploration to leverage that, that infrastructure. And we'll benefit from that as they realize their exploration potential. Yeah, fantastic. Now, you talked about putting the right bums on seats earlier in the call. I'm wondering if we can, I guess, shift again and, and talk about the, the management team that makes up this wonderful organization, because I think that's important for context. Would you mind sharing a little bit about the people that you work with? Absolutely. Um, it's not a big team, and that's the beauty of the, uh, the royalty business. It's eminently scalable. You don't have to inflate your G&A significantly to grow your business because at the end of the day, we're not operating the mines. We're taking interest in them. We're acting effectively as a financial institution. Yeah. But that being said, when you look at the board management gold royalty, we have collectively over 250 years of mine operating experience. So I'm not talking about 
uh, financial experience. I'm talking about mine operating mine experience. Operating, yep. Yeah, and I, you know, over my 30 year career, I've, I've run two major companies. I've been involved in four major companies, uh, three of them in, in the C suite. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've been involved in the construction of 15 separate mines over my 30 year career and, and have, have been responsible for the operation of countless more. Um, also on my board is Alan Hare. Um, Alan was my successor at Hud Bay as CEO. He was my chief operating officer when we ran Hud Bay. 35 years of experience as a metallurgical engineer, and he's a prolific mine builder. We built three major mines when I was running Hud Bay, and he was the gentleman that was directly responsible for that. Also um, within my management team is John Griffith. John uh, comes from an investment banking background, but from a mining family from South Africa. And John was the head of the mining group Bank of America Merrill Lynch in the Americas uh, yep. before he joined us as our chief development officer. Also on our board is Warren Gilman. Warren runs Queens Road Capital out of Hong Kong, which is Lee Kai Shing's Natural Resource Fund. Before doing that, Warren was an investment banker with CIBC in Canada and Australasia, running their mining group for many, many years, and so knows the business inside out, yep. has a technical background as well. So, and, and then finally, Ian Telfer is the chair of our advisory board. Ian was my chairman at Gold Corp, uh, but also was the founder of Wheaton Precious Metals. He spun it out of Gold Corp 15 years ago, and Wheaton is now the second biggest streaming and royalty company by market cap. And it's exactly the same model that we pursued the Gold Royalty. We've replicated, um, you know, Wheaton Precious Metals was spun out of Gold Corp with royalties initially on some of Gold Corp's assets and then started to diversify away from that and grew to the company it is today. So I'm leveraging Ian's expertise in doing precisely that as we spun Gold Royalty out of Gold Mining Inc. with royalties on all dozen of their projects to provide a foundational element to Gold Royalty as we look to grow the business beyond that. And just a couple of months ago, we completed an IPO for Gold Mm -hmm. Royalty Yep. We raised $90 million U.S. Wow. have a post-money uh, post money valuation of $200 million U.S. or a market cap of $200 million U.S. So we have a, a strong treasury with no debt on the balance sheet. We have a staffed out team, and we're looking at uh, putting that capital to work for the benefit of our shareholders. And there are some very sharp tools in that shed, that's for sure, and certain, and some very um, some bright um, horizon there. Also, I'm wondering um, what is the tickers for this this uh, organization? It's, it's a G R O Y G R O Y on the New York Stock Exchange, and we're you can find more information about us at goldroyalty.com. Fantastic. Look, if you've uh, been listening into this call and you've taken anything away, fantastic. There is certainly a lot to learn. And if you want to learn more about goldroyalty.com, there will be that URL below this post. No matter where you um, find it, you will find the link back to goldroyalty.com. And with that all being said, David, thank you so very much for spending some time with me on the My Future Business Show today. Well, thank you for your time, Rick. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks for joining us today. If you enjoyed the call, then make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, share us with your friends and book your spot on the show at myfuturebusiness.com forward slash interviews. And if you're looking for solutions that will help grow your business, then visit myfuturebusiness.com forward slash shop.